Good morning. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to yet another edition of Truth to Power. My name is Faraz Patel. I will be in your company for the next 45 to 50 minutes. On the 17th of Ramadan, one of the greatest battles in history had occurred. It was one of the most important dates for us as Muslims and it laid the foundations of Islam. It is none other than the Battle of Badr. You know the numbers, 313 against 1,000. But the angel sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had changed all of that. And this was one of the greatest victories that ever happened to the Muslims. And as I said, laid the foundations for Islam to spread across the globe. Well, to dissect the 17th of Ramadan, to dissect the Battle of Badr, I would like to welcome Molana Sarfaraz Hamza. He is the member of the Sunni Ulama Council. Molana, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to you, Brother Faraz, and to all those viewing and listening. Now, it's an absolute pleasure to have you. Molana, let's first, of course, take a look at the migration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and, of course, so many of his sahaba to Medina Sharif. How did that sow the roots for this battle to take place? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa al-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen, as-salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil musaleen. سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم ربنا لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقتة من لساني يفقه قولي ربنا زدنا علما ورزقنا فهما رب يسر ولا تعسر ربنا تمن بالخير so um, it's a very good question for us but if we you know how far can we go back in history and everything prior to the Battle of Badr sort of set up the scenes that took place eventually on the day of the Battle of Badr. Of the Battle of Badr. But if we look at the migration from the migration of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, remember the migration of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam happened at a very critical point in, and it was a very important change in the political power, the spiritual power, the physical power that was wielded by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions uh, as they were in Mecca to a completely new kind of phase that they would experience when they were in Medina. While in Mecca, the focus was on uh, humanity. While in Mecca, the focus was on spreading the message of, uh, of equality, peace and justice, which are the very core principles which Islam has come down to lay to ensure that no black is better than a white, to ensure that no a white is better than a black, to ensure that no Arab is better than a non-Arab, no, and a non-Arab better than an Arab. All those kind of rules were set, most of them were set in Mecca when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was gaining followers and people to understand what the what the complete what the what Islam was about, mm. how to submit yourself to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in relation to your fellow human beings. Mm. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated to Medina, the kind of uh, of of political change that would now happen in the Muslim world would would see that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now became the leader of the people of Medina. He had gone into negotiation with the tribes that were in Medina so that they would make Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that, that, that leader from a political standpoint. It also obviously therefore changes the kind of uh, 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 power that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wielded in terms of the region. In Mecca, he was just secluded to his community mm -hmm. and to the Muslims that he had had under his wing. But when he came to Medina, he was now a political leader, um, not only to the Muslims, but he was a leader to the Jewish tribes that were in Medina. And there were other advents um, uh, that, 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 for example, give us clarity. Just prior to the Hijrah of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we recall that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went on, uh, on the Mi'raj. Now, why is this important? You know, we may, we may not understand how all these links come together, but if we look at the Mi'raj that happened just prior to the uh, migration, we see, um, and I don't want to go into the entire incident or, uh, of Mi'raj, but we see that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was taken by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala after, uh, after Amul Huzn, after a, a time of grief, 
because he lost his wife and he lost his uncle Hamza radiallahu ta'ala and Huma um, and he lost them in battle and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the Mi'raj and what do we notice about the Mi'raj? Not from a miraculous point of view, not from a spiritual point of view, not from a point of view of the Salah and so on, but from a political point of view. We see that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on his journey, we read a hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, sees Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu was salam qa'iman yusalli fi qabrihi. He is standing and he performs salah in his qabr. Later on, we see that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, ascends to the seven heavens. In the, in, 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 in the heavens, who does he meet? One of the prophets he meets in the heavens again? Musa alayhi salatu was salam. So he meets Musa alayhi salatu was salam again. Hang on. But before that, when he gets to Masjid al-Aqsa, he performs salah as Imam al-Anbiya. He is the Imam of all the Anbiya. And they are performing salah behind him as the Imam. Amongst them is again Musa alayhi salatu was salam. And when he gets to the heavens, he meets again Musa alayhi salatu was salam. And when he goes to and fro to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, negotiating from 50 to 5 salah again and again, he doesn't stop at the seventh heaven where he meets Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. He comes down to where he meets Musa alayhi salatu was salam. And the entire to and fro happens between him and Musa alayhi salatu was salam. No, your ummah won't be able to manage this. Go back to Allah, negotiate more. He meets Musa alayhi salatu was salam so much. Why this Nabi? Why does he meet this Nabi so much? Why does he see this Nabi so much on his Mi'raj journey prior to the migration? And the response that many scholars have written is simply it was strategic because the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his migration to Mecca was going to migrate towards a land where he would rule over people and tribes from the Jewish faith. And the Jewish prophet is Musa alayhi salatu was salam. So see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepares his Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not only from a spiritual and whatever point of view, but from a political point of view. He familiarizes his Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with that prophet of who, who or that prophet who is the leader of the prophets, uh, who is the leader of the, of, of the people that he will eventually go and lead in Medina. So when the Prophet وسلم, comes into Medina, we know the, 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 the famous hadith, the Prophet وسلم, on the 10th of Muharram finds that the Jewish people are fasting upon inquiring from them, why are you fasting? They respond to Rasul وسلم, and say, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Musa وسلم, from the clutches of Fir'aun on this day. So we give gratitude and the Prophet sallallahu says, Nahnu awla. we are closer to Musa والسلام, than they are. So he commands his companions to fast on the 9th and the 10th or the 10th and the 11th. You see, he doesn't shun the idea of Musa. He embraces the idea of Musa والسلام. Politically, this is so important to understand. And so when we're going to come to the battle of Badr, we will come to understand that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wielded that kind of power in Medina and was prepared for that role of leadership by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Not only at that moment of migration, but prior to the migration, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala was already preparing his Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for that position of power that he would eventually wield in Medina. Well, Anna, and, and, and keeping in the political perspective also, we saw this is years and years before transatlantic slavery had taken the fold, that there was slavery and persecution, especially of, you know, revert Muslims and that of, you know, black Africans who were sold as slaves by the uh, non-believing Quraysh at the time. That was another point to bring in that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said, we need to challenge the status quo, what is happening right now. So exactly that. And that's why I also we mentioned in the beginning when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in Mecca, the kind of power that he wielded there, he could, he could lay the foundation of humanity. He could lay the foundation of uh, Islam's view on slavery, on Insla Islam's view on oppression, on Islam's view on all these humanitarian uh, uh, situations. But he would, he would more emphatically be able to politically impose those kind of uh, uh, um, those kind of policies if it were, uh, if, if you were those kind of policies he was able to implement them when he was a leader in Medina mm -hmm. and so that is that is so correct when you say that that's what Islam came to do it came to revolutionize that Arabian Peninsula and not only the Arabian Peninsula the entire world 
uh, uh, on the on the policies of how humans should be human beings should be treating one another on how we should oppose oppression on how we should stand for justice and against injustice these were the very foundations that that islam was based on Malana Hamza will be back after this break you view stay tuned the condition uh, the discussion excuse me with regards to the battle of badr continue stay tuned Welcome back to Truth to Power. We are continuing our conversation on the Battle of Badr that happening on Ramadan, which happened, excuse me, on Ramadan the 17th. My guest is Molana Sarfaraz Hamza from the Sunni Ulama Council. Molana, welcome back. Uh, Obu Sufyan, of course, we all know him as this notorious Quraysh tribesman who loved, he, he was thirsty for battle. He, of course, started raiding caravans and the Muslims, on the other hand, started countering in raiding caravans of the Quraysh. It's sort of like, I give you one punch, you give me one punch, we are heading into battle. Yeah, so uh, when we, uh, you know, Abu Sufyan at the time, mm. uh, Abu Sufyan, uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, became a uh, Muslim at the conquest of Mecca, mm. uh, the father of Amir uh, Muawiyah. Um, he was, he played a significant role, obviously, uh, we know that the chiefs of Mecca were not happy that the Prophet Sallallahu found refuge and not only refuge, found a position of political power in Medina, knowing very well that the caravans of Mecca would have to pass through Medina. And, you know, different historians record the situation and the context of how those caravans passed in different ways. Uh, needless to say, there was an agenda by both the Quraysh and a counter agenda by the Muslims mm. to obviously establish some kind of, of stronghold. Mm. And this comes off the back of all the oppression. We've just spoken before mm. the break mm. about all the how Islam came to emphatically stamp out oppression and injustice and things like that. There was no way that they could allow the uh, the oppression, and we can go into detail on the, a little bit more detail on this. Uh, we could, there was no way they could allow the oppression that was experienced by the Mecca, by the Muslims in Mecca mm. that were remaining in Mecca, as well as the deliberate taunting of the Muslims in Medina and taunting of the Ansar and taunting of the other non-Muslim tribes that were in Medina by the by uh, Abu Sufyan and by the other uh, leaders of the Quraysh who were trying to um, who were trying to uh, trying to get away the idea we're trying to wipe out the idea that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has any kind of political power in medina and that he should not have gotten a refuge by the tribes of medina and that he should not have been able to wield that kind of power in terms of in terms of of of, of what happens to the muslims in mecca and the muslims obviously felt on the on, on the counter that look our things in Mecca were being looted. They were being looted. Once the Muhajirun had migrated from Mecca to Medina, obviously their belongings, their families, their positions remained behind. And those positions and things were being, and the family members were being harassed and were being uh, not only harassed, were being looted, were being taken. And so the counter was to send a message to the people, to the tribes of Mecca. And this is what, what set up eventually, you, you know, you think about the month of Ramadan, just uh, Sha'ban prior to that was the, was the, um, the commandment given for for fasting, mm. and uh, uh, you know, and, and 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 you know, you have the situation where you've just been commanded the month before that Ramadan must be a month of fasting. Mm. On the seventeenth of the month of Ramadan, you have been asked for the first time that you are going through a, a a period of abstaining from food and drink for such a long period of time. You've been asked to engage. What was the political idea? Why the month of Ramadan? Why the caravans passing? Were Muslims on the defensive? Or were Muslims on the offensive? Mm -hmm. 
Um, these questions, obviously, historians differ about, and many people who write about it, obviously, depending on the context and the background, they differ about it. And we can go into a discussion regarding that. But like you said, Abu Sufyan leading Ibn Harb, leading that kind of Muslim, uh, sorry, leading the Quraysh into that, they were deliberately trying to throw that punch and there was a counter punch. It was it was loot, and there were there were minor skirmishes that occurred obviously before the Battle of Badr. But these minor skirmishes eventually culminated in this this huge Battle of Badr. Molana, well, let's go to the battle now. You've got one thousand Quraysh. You've got three hundred thirteen Muslims. Now, to any non-Muslim viewer that is watching this, they'll say, "This is this is it's unanimous that the Quraysh are easily going to win this." But how important was Yaqeen and the strength in belief in Allah important in getting the Muslims to victory? Because Rasulullah can set up the army, can set up who's going to be on the attack. And, but how was this important, these two factors in helping the Muslims get such a historic victory on that day? Okay, so... So, uh, you know, that's why we mentioned it happened in the battle in, in the Ramadan. Mm -hmm. Now, if you noticed for many, for many of us, we, we have no idea what it's like to put our lives, lives on the line. Oh, for most of us, mm -hmm. we have no idea what it means to give your life for a cause so badly mm -hmm. that you are willing to stay the sword or, or the gun, which they didn't have at that time, down the stay the down the battle of the gun, mm. and, and 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 still be steadfast and strong in your belief and in your conviction. And this is why we have radiallahu anhum wa radu an liman rabba. That's why we have Allah subhanahu wa taala speaking so highly of the companions ridwanullahi taala alayhim ajma'in. It was for this reason that we have the hadith Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also says ashabi kan nujum bi ayyim iqta my companions are like the stars whichever one of them you follow you will be guided because these people were so steadfast they were so convicted and con uh, so convinced uh, and that so much conviction sorry for the for the for their belief and for what they understood was the haq and the Prophet ﷺ spent years prior to that uh, driving that particular point home. And that is why it's important to understand the period of migration. What was Makkah there for? Why didn't the Prophet ﷺ get refuge in Medina? Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send him there directly from the beginning? Because you needed to establish, and sometimes we need to take an ibrah, we need to take an, a lesson from this. Because you know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he, he set it up in such a way that the Prophet sallallahu and his companions would spend the years prior to Badr building up that conviction, building up that yaqeen, building up that certainty, understanding what is justice as opposed to injustice, what is truth as opposed to falsehood, and then being able to willingly give their life for the sake of standing up. It was only 313 men, like you mentioned in the beginning, against an army of a thousand men. But if you understand the, the wisdom in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you find men, not, not only the battle of Badr, if you look at the battle that, you know, Tariq bin Ziyad, that he took uh, later on in, 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 in Spain and so on, many of them happened, it happened in the month of Ramadan. But the month of Ramadan has this way while you may not have the physical sustenance, the spiritual willpower, the determination that one has, the mental strength that one has in the month of Ramadan far supersedes the kind of spiritual and mental le uh, level that you can have at any other time of the year. So people are looking at it only from a physical point of view and saying, well, in the month of Ramadan, I'm weak. Uh, but <laughs> you also have so much conviction because mm. if you can abstain from food and drink and, 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 and sexual activity, which are permissible throughout the year, you can abstain from it. You can understand the willpower of that person. Then for someone to still taunt you and to bring you and to fight you, you have that. It's, you know, I don't know how to explain to the, to, to, to the viewers simply to say that, you know, a coach of a soccer team, he knows if he keeps a good player as a substitute on a bench, that substitute is hungry for the game. And when you put him on afterwards, his fight is so much stronger. I know this is a, 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 an underestimate. We cannot compare a football game to the Battle of Badr. 
but to give, to make it just a little bit more relatable uh, uh, and relevant for our, our viewers and for our listeners, just to understand how hungry the Muslims were to be able to avenge the kind of atrocities that had been perpetrated against them and their family members and their belongings and their loved ones in Mecca, and how they were willing to not allow the the Quraysh who were in Mecca to uh, to continue to abuse them and oppress them and and subjugate them while they were still in Medina, uh, miles away. They had to make the point during this particular time. And so the kind of conviction and yaqeen they had was not only from a, I believe, la ilaha illallah kind of spiritual point of view, not from only a, a yaqeen, a belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala point of view, but it was driven by, by dunya matters as well. And that's okay because Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana tawakina adhab al nar. Then we must also add to all of this that these were no ordinary people. We can aspire uh, to be like them, but around every Nabi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts puts a very, very special select few that are there to ensure that the kalima of haq, that the word of truth will always be established on the earth. If we look at Isa alayhi salatu wasalam and we look at the Hawariyun, the, the, the disciples that he had. And so we find that around many of the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put these support structures, the Sahaba ikram, the Quran speaks at length about them. How do we even begin to describe the dust on the feet of the Sahaba Ikram that they had 330 men against a thousand men a clear what we would determine a walkover or what we would consider a walkover yet they had that fight that con conviction and when the Muslims won the battle of Badr it made the victory that much sweeter because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was with them and after the break we'll be discussing just how that victory was achieved stay tuned to Truth to Power Welcome back to Truth to Power. We are continuing our conversation with regards to the Battle of Badr and how this laid the foundations for myself and of course the rest of the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to being in existence as we speak. I'm still in conversation with Molana Safaraz Hamza. Molana Hamza, it's Ramadan. Now, I've never been to the Holy Lands and inshallah I hope Allah will be able to take me there of course once the coronavirus pandemic has uh, left us. I, I don't know if you've obviously been to Mecca and Medina, but just give an idea of the conditions that, of course, are near the wells of Badr, and especially in Ramadan, and especially the physical, you know, uh, test that the, the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to go through at that time. But then, of course, comes the Malaika, and that is the true miracle of the Battle of Badr. Okay, so obviously we know it's the month of Ramadan, the Muslims, uh, it's the second year of Hijrah, 13th of March, 14, uh, 624. Um, we, the second year after Hijrah, the 17th of Ramadan, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hears that a, 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 a caravan is passing by of the Quraysh. It's an opportunity to, for the Muslims to go out and establish their political power, their political authority, and also to avenge the, the, the taunting and the oppression that their loved ones and their families. Remember something, if you, and I just want to accept this as well, if you if you are, if your loved ones are being attacked, mm. if your loved one, if your possessions are being taken, there is that constant element of, of worry and concern that you will have. Are my friends safe? Are my brothers safe? Are my sisters safe? Is my position safe? Is my inheritance? My parents are no longer there. Are they safe? And realistically, those are things that people are concerned about in the dunya. And so the, the, it was also a point where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam needed to also sh give that, that, that support to his companions to show that we have stood by for far too long 
while these people have gone out and persecuted us and oppressed us, it is now time for us to establish our authority. And now that we are in Medina, I've asked you to sacrifice your homes, your families. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked you to migrate and you've made a great migration, leaving loved ones, sacrificing so much for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that level of sacrifice. Amen. Amen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. And now I want to, and now you feel that we can't still be taking it on the chin. We need to retaliate. We need to show and establish our authority. So it's warm. It's, it, we know Mecca is extremely hot. And coming out to the area of Badr, those who have gone to visit there will know how, how hot it is over there. You have to come out during the day and you have to line up and you know that you barely have, you barely have in today's time ammunition. Mm. You have a few horses, you have a few, uh, uh, you know, uh, armored uh, individuals that is able to defend against a thousand people. If we look at the planes, those who have seen the pictures and the, the depictions of how the Battle of Badr, you can see there were dunes on either side and that these, these dunes would have, these sandy desert dunes would have been blowing. And so you can imagine the kind of dry mouths kind of fight that the, the companions would have had when they had to go and intercept the, uh, intercept the caravan at the Battle of Badr. So uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they engage in battle, we know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sends three companions and they send three companions. And the way it was that time is that they would first have, they would first, a duel would happen. And when the duel would take place, um, uh, uh, Obviously, uh, the, there were three duels that took place and the Muslims had won all those duels, those battles. And by having won those battles, eventually it broke out into a huge fight. As, uh, as you people would, people would have seen, viewers would know, this is how battle took place in the time of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not only amongst the Muslims, but amongst the tribes of the particular area and things like that. And let's not forget, the, on the night of the 15th, uh, sorry, on the night of the, of the, uh, the 15th of Ramadan, it was raining on the battlefield and the surrounding areas. Um, and, and, and many Muslims consider that this was a, 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 some kind of mercy, a rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, because the slopes that the Kufar and the Quraysh had to climb were muddy. And also it subdued a lot of the dust. But nonetheless, it was difficult for, for the Muslims to go out in the month of Ramadan. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as you rightfully said, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the malaika, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran, in, in verse 124 of Surah, uh, Surah Ali Imran, remember when you said to the believers, it is, is it not enough for you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you with 3,000 angels specially sent down? Now, many accounts have come to explain how the Quraysh had eventually become so fearful and how during the battle, after people were being killed and people were being slain, and we know there's an entire list, we can't go through or the entire list of the, of the martyrs of Badr, but uh, how, the, how people were being killed on both sides. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed the fear in the hearts of the kuffar by these malaika. Who's to say how, how, how else that fear came in, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who knows very well, who explains to us uh, that, that, that he sent 3,000 malaika to help and assist the believers on the plains and the battle of Badr. Mulana Hamza, there were heroes uh, within the Muslim camp, but there was none other than the courageous uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Hazrat Hamza radiallahu anhu. We, we, we learn of his experience as being a warrior, a soldier, with years and years of battle hardened in him. How did that help? How did these heroics and experience help in helping the Mujahideen of that time? So, you know, Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu ta'ala and who fought the battle of Badr, um, he, in fact, on his journey to Badr, he shared a camel with Zayd bin Harith mm. and... Um, and, you know, his, his role in the Battle of Badr was not only significant because of the kind of uh, character and personality that he had, but his role was significant because leading up to the to the Battle of Badr in the, in the time when the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in Mecca, how Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu ta'ala and uh, uh, how he defended Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how he, uh, 
how he was willing to take Islam out in the public to ensure that Haq was established. And, and you know, people that came across Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu ta'ala, they, were, they didn't want to get on the wrong side of Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu ta'ala. And we recall when Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, who was just as brave and was also big in stature, when he came to, um, to martyr the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he met, I don't want to go into the entire incident, but he meets a man who diverts him to his sister. And he goes to meet his sister and her husband, who he finds reading the Quran. Eventually, he beats them up and uh, his heart gets softened. He reads the Quran and he, he, he finds out that he actually wants to take the Shahada. So he goes to the house of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and nobody there at the time knows that Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab wants to accept Islam. Who is the one that attends the door that goes to see when Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab comes to the door of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Who's the one that stands at the door? It is Sayyidina Hamza. Now, I'm sure all the viewers and listeners have heard about the authoritative, strong, brave Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, how he was ready to strike uh, anyone's head off who was, who was going to oppose Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa This was the character of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala. But when he comes to the door and no one knows his intentions, who opens the door? Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu ta'ala. And Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu ta'ala is older than him, but is not afraid to put him exactly on his place, to let him know that if his motives, uh, if he has ulterior motives, if his motives and his agendas are not pure, then he will have to face Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu ta'ala. That just gives you an idea of the character of this particular personality. And, um, and so we find that it was, uh, and when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went out, it was Sayyidina Hamza Radiallahu Ta'ala, he found so much, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam found so much of, sang, uh, he found a sanctuary in his uncle, Sayyidina Hamza Radiallahu Ta'ala, and that's why when Sayyidina Hamza Radiallahu Ta'ala was killed uh, at the hands of Utbah bin Rabia, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took this extremely hard. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took the, 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 the demise of his uh, of his uncle extremely difficult. Molana Hamza, before we go to the break, uh, prisoners of war, and of course uh, this was a theme that happened, obviously in the Arabian Peninsula, and a lot of you know uh, tribesmen would say, well, you know what, we're going to kill our prisoners of war, or we're going to put them into you know complete slavery. But Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was so different. How did his generosity and his mercy as a leader? show true leadership at that time? You know, uh, uh, Farhaz, brother Farhaz, mm. this question really, it, it melts your heart. Mm. Not, not to think of just the generosity of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but it's sad, it gives me goosebumps just to think of what's the point we answer this question and we live in a community and a society like we do today where we claim to be Muslim, but cannot even understand the spirit of Islam. We cannot understand the spirit that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed throughout his life. And the Battle of Badr was only a highlight of the, the, the exemplary character of our Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Says Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the Quran, we have not sent you but as a mercy to the world. Yes, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent as a mercy, but we, the followers of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how then can we not be mandated in his absence, physical absence, to be a mercy to the rest of the world? We fight amongst one another. We argue with one another. We look for differences with one another. We have agendas against one another. We are constantly bickering and moaning amongst ourselves. And I say that with, because the question is, it's only related to this. But if we answer this question and we speak about the rahmah, the mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in the heart of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to, di to display at the, um, to the prisoners at the Battle of Badr, what are, what, are, what are we viewers and listeners going to take away from it? Mm. Are we going to sit back in awe and am amaze ourselves at, the, um, at, the, at history? At the character of our illustrious predecessors of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we're going to tell the stories and recite our praise of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, explaining his, his heart and his purity and his rahmah and his mercy 
to the people, uh, to the prisoners of war, while in the meantime, we are not going to take a lesson and make it relevant to our lives, then the question and the show becomes futile. If there's anything that the listeners and the viewers should know about the Battle of Badr more than by hearting the, 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 the martyrs, more than about understanding the miraculous nature of the 3,000 angels that came onto the battlefield, more than knowing that the Prophet وسلم, lost his, his, his beloved uncle, more than knowing the fact that the Muslims were against all odds, that the Muslims were defending, more than anything you should know about the Battle of Badr is to know the Rahmah displayed by Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the prisoners of war. In this day and age, we need that lesson to prevail. We need that lesson to be highlighted out of, for me. Look, everybody might have a different, be at a different point in their life. Everybody may feel that there's a different lesson to learn from the Battle of Badr for them. But for me personally, in the day and age we live, uh, uh, we, we find ourselves in today, where we find that there's barely an Eid that Muslims can have together. Everything we do is different. Everything we do is we look to, to be, we, everybody wants to have their own leader. Everybody's mm -hmm. sheikh is right. Everybody wants to be a leader unto themselves. But you know what? The lesson we learn from the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the Battle of Badr is that the greatest leaders are first the greatest followers. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being the greatest follower of this deen of Tawheed, this deen of oneness to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, being the greatest follower made him the greatest leader. And so we need to take a lesson from that. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is confronted about the opinion on what has to, the decision that needs to be taken about the prisoners of Badr, Obviously, there needs to be something fair. There needs to be something that the Muhajirun, who had sacrificed their lives on the battlefield, they sacrificed their loved ones, they had sacrificed the, they, they've gone out in the month of Ramadan. It was not an easy task, but the Prophet ﷺ had to make a decision that not only would establish his authority as a, as a carer, as a leader, as an Amir of his people, but he also had to make a decision that would make sure that the enemy would be attracted to the beauty that he would be displaying. And that kind of conundrum really puts you in that, that, that be, you're between a rock and a hard place. How do you satisfy someone who lost their family, friends, loved ones, and everything on the battlefield moments ago? And how do you, how do you do that? But at the same time, make sure that the enemy you fought are not disheartened uh, and not and not unattracted to the way you handle things. And this is where the wisdom and hikmah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in the heart of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came in. Because by having the wealthy uh, pay uh, their ransom, firstly ensured that the economic benefit to the Muslim who had now migrated from Mecca to Medina would be a little bit more established. It would fast track they settling in Medina. It would ensure that the kind of pool or kitty or Baytul Mal that was established, it would ensure that the welfare of the state was secure from a financial and economic perspective. The second point we know is that those who were unable to establish, who were unable to pay the ransom because they were too poor to do so, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked that the, those educated among them teach the Ansar, they teach those who were, who were, uh, uh, who were uneducated, if I can call it, amongst the, amongst the, uh, amongst the Madinites, amongst those in Medina. Why is this important? And we can understand this from a political point of view. Look at it. Where does the root of our problems lie? It lies in economics and education. And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we can say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was Ummi, he was unlettered. We can say our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam couldn't read and couldn't write. But how could a man who not read and who not write know that in response to be able to quell the, the and to be able to suppress the kind of anger that may have been experienced by his followers, as well as attract the, the, his enemies to the deen, and in all of this, make a such a profound political decision mm. that would have a direct impact on the economics and education of his new society and his new community. This, for me, is so amazing that a man of that, that people would say an unlettered prophet, prophet from Arabia, was able to 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 get all of this 
in today's day and age, if a man like Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who could focus on the economics and the education of his people, ensured that, then their dunya would be fine. Then we would have, we would, I mean, ask anybody who is, who is involved in business, ask anybody who's involved in education. When you have that, you have a sound society for this dunya. And that's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sought to establish by the decision he made when he came to the prisoners of Badr. Wow, it's just so amazing that he had that kind of response. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala give us the opportunity to take an, an ibrah, a lesson from this, because the, uh, you know, I'm so emotional and I know I'm going oh, on and right. ranting and raving yeah. about it, but it just amazes me at this decision that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took at that particular time. No, I mean, Thuma, I mean to that. And after the break, we will be discussing post Battle of Badr and, of course, some of the defeats the Muslim had. But what lessons will we learn from that? Stay tuned. Welcome back to Truth to Power. We are wrapping up the conversation with regards to the miracle of the Battle of Badr. And my guest is Mulana Sarfaraz Hamza. Mulana Hamza, there, were, there was a defeat, obviously, after the Battle of Badr, the killing of uh, Hazrat Hamza radiallahu anhu. But after that, of course, came such a significant moment when the Muslims marched to Mecca. Just you know, give us an idea of how that from a political perspective, but also from a Dini perspective, changed so much. Um, you know, when we look at the, the Battle of Badr, it not, you know, it, it established the power and authority. And you need to look at this in context of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but you need to look at this in context of where it started, uh, you know, just a decade earlier, uh, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first, uh, you know, announced and, uh, you know, his nubuwa. Um, uh, and uh, and when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came, how many of them would have taken the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam seriously to that point? Mm. How many of them would have thought that this man single-handedly would transform and change the landscape of the Arabian Peninsula? How many of them would have would have fathomed and envisaged this kind of thing happening? How many times didn't they plot to kill the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam when they sensed danger? How many times didn't they uh, try to negotiate with the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam to suppress his efforts um, at uh, inviting people to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa taala, to the words of Tawheed, to justice and 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 the importance of. Uh, uh, equality and uh, in society. How many times didn't they do this? Never in the wildest dreams would they have imagined that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have been able to achieve what he had achieved in the space of 10 years. So the Battle of Badr was so significant and it ensured, you know, what was, we also know that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Abu Jahl, hmm. the man who was a leader of, you know, a great tribesman of the Quraysh, uh, amongst the Quraysh nobles, that he was um, that he was killed at the Battle of Badr, mm. and this was important because he was one of those individuals who significantly tried to quell the rise of Islam. He really tried to go and sow animosity and hatred, and 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 for people to harbor ill feelings towards the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And why this was significant was because remember, after the Battle of Badr, what happens is that Abu Sufyan, whom you've mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. it gave him almost the opportunity by default to become a, a leader amongst the Quraysh. Mm -hmm. And so when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, six years later marches into, uh, at, the, at the conquest of Mecca comes in, it is Abu Sufyan who eventually is the leader and helps the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam negotiate a peaceful surrender at Mecca. So if you think about it, the, the events at Badr continue right after the Battle of Badr. Mm -hmm. It makes sure, and that's why the, the, the historians write that there are two important people that get a important political position uh, positions after the Battle of Badr. One is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the other is Abu Sufyan. By, by that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not only had authority and leadership over Medina, but by having Abu Sufyan six years later help him to and, and, and also become Muslim at the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now had what we go to as um, the um, 
Haramain Sharifain, the honorable two sacred cities, it becomes under Muslim rule because of this kind of thing. And so we find that that all started at the Battle of Badr. It was at the Battle of Badr that Abu, uh, that, uh, uh, that Abu Jahal was killed. It was and, 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 and led, uh, passed the way for Abu Sufyan. It was at the Battle of Badr that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw uh, that overnight the people of Makkah uh, started uh, understanding that this leader of this, that they chased away, this leader of uh, amongst them that had, they had sent away to Medina had now established a stronghold in Medina uh, 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 you know, by themselves, and they were a force to be reckoned with. Yeah. So there was no longer this kind of, and, and that's why it's so, it's, there are many other significant points that we can speak about when it comes. But for me, I think those are two important things, because if you look at it from a political landscape point of view, Makkah and Medina, because of what is initiated at Badr, Makkah and Medina become under the, under the rule of, 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 of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Mulana Hamza, there's so much to speak about, you know, just looking post-Badr and of course the conquests that have happened. But time has of course uh, permitted us from not speaking further. We'd like to say Jazakallah to you for making the time for us and of course sharing your wisdom. Barakallah, um, our dua is just, you know, that, you know, these programs happen and we make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our shortcomings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and allow us to benefit in these last days of Ramadan, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our hearts and let us take sincere lessons from the Battle of Badr. May he use, may we use the ibrah, the, uh, the lesson of the Battle of Badr to strengthen our iman, to benefit in dunya and akhirah, not just to tell a fairy tale to our, our loved ones and our, our children, not just to get them worked up emotionally, mm -hmm. but to allow them to think uh, practically mm -hmm. and to make it relevant to what we find ourselves facing today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our hearts and guide us. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the, and, uh, you know, apologies for what happened earlier. The, we had a struggle with the, with the audio and video. <laughs> but may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, reward you for your patience. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. No, it's an absolute pleasure. Mulana Sarfaraz Hamza, member of the Sunni Ulama Council for making time for us. And just before we close off, of course, uh, we are in the last days of Ramadan. So, you know, one of the most important factors, as he says, is that the Battle of Badr should not be used as a fairy tale story so we can speak about how great the war was. But it was, of course, to discuss the Rahma of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and, of course, the seeds laying the foundation for Islam to spread not only across the Arabian Peninsula, but right here at home in South Africa. It would not be done on it would not be done if it wasn't for the strength, the belief, the sacrifice and, of course, the execution of the Muslims on that day, on the 17th of Ramadan. Well, that's all we have for you here on Truth to Power. I will see you for another episode. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.